Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. The teachings that you have invested in me has produced healing and relationship with God in my life. So I'm just eternally grateful to you and to your ministry. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to my Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the beginning of my fourth week of teaching verse by verse through the book of Galatians, and we're in Galatians chapter 4 and down in verse 20. I've been teaching on this for four weeks, and uh, there's just no way I could go back and summarize everything I've said. So please take advantage of these materials. I'm offering my living commentary, which is a verse by verse commentary on the entire Bible. I've got a commentary on every verse in the book of Galatians, but I've got 26,000 footnotes in the Bible that I've written. And then we're also, we're updating my teaching verse by verse through the book of Galatians, and this is DVDs or CDs that were taken from these television programs, and you can have those. Uh, We'll be making that offer at the end of the program. So again, back to Galatians chapter 4, and in verse... 20, he says, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. And uh, if you've missed any of this, man, Galatians is Paul just being brutal with these people. He introduced them to Christ by faith, and people had come along after they had received salvation and had already been walking in the freedom and the liberty that Christ had given them. They had legalistic Jews come along that told them, oh, yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but you've also got to be a Jew, and you've got to keep all of the Jewish laws and regulations. Uh, Specifically, circumcision was one of the main things that he talked about in this book, but also observing the Sabbath and certain days and weeks and years and all of those things. And so Paul had just been brutal with them, and he says, I'm I'm in doubt of whether or not you're going to continue in your relationship with the Lord. And then he said this in verse... 21, he says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Boy, this is awesome. He said this same thing in the third chapter. Let me just go back and reference this real quickly. But back here in the uh, third chapter in verse 7, he says, Know ye therefore that they which uh, be of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, as the Scripture is said. And then he just talks about uh, those of you that desire to be under the law. Don't you hear what the law says? And the truth is that most people who are preaching that you have to keep a certain level of holiness in order to receive from God, they don't really understand what they're saying. The same thing is said over in 1 Timothy chapter 1 where he says there's people that desire to be teachers of the law and they don't understand what they're saying. BECAUSE THE LAW DOESN'T SAY JUST DO THE BEST YOU CAN. AND IF YOU GET NINE OUT OF TEN THINGS RIGHT, YOU MAKE A 90 ON YOUR TEST. NO, THE LAW SAYS YOU'VE GOT TO KEEP EVERYTHING. IF YOU GET ONE QUESTION WRONG OUT OF A HUNDRED, YOU FLUNK. YOU FAIL THE WHOLE THING. AND PEOPLE WHO PREACH THE LAW AND PREACH HOLINESS JUST CONVENIENTLY LEAVE THAT PART OF THE LAW OUT. I'VE ACTUALLY HAD PEOPLE CONFRONT ME BEFORE AND SAY, YOU'VE GOT TO STILL KEEP THOSE TEN COMMANDMENTS. YOU'VE STILL GOT TO DO ALL OF THESE THINGS OR GOD WON'T BLESS YOU. GOD WON'T ANSWER YOUR PRAYER. AND I'LL SIT THERE AND SAY, SO DO YOU KEEP ALL OF THEM? WELL, NO, I DON'T don't DO IT PERFECTLY, BUT... WELL, SEE, THEN YOU'VE MISSED THE WHOLE POINT OF THE LAW. YOU EITHER HAVE TO KEEP THEM PERFECTLY AND YOU HAVE TO FULFILL ALL OF THE PRECEPTS OF THE LAW. JAMES 2.10 SAYS, uh, IF YOU KEEP THE WHOLE LAW AND YET OFFEND IN ONE POINT, YOU BECOME GUILTY OF ALL. SO YOU EITHER NEED TO KEEP THE LAW PERFECTLY, WHICH YOU CAN'T DO, OR YOU NEED TO PUT FAITH IN A SAVIOR. SO THIS IS THE POINT THAT PAUL IS MAKING RIGHT HERE. HE SAYS, TELL ME, YE THAT DESIRE TO BE UNDER THE LAW, DO YOU NOT HEAR THE LAW? FOR IT IS WRITTEN THAT ABRAHAM HAD TWO SONS, THE ONE BY A BONDWOMAN AND THE OTHER BY A FREE WOMAN. AND AGAIN, FOR THOSE OF YOU THAT AREN'T FAMILIAR WITH THIS STORY IN THE OLD TESTAMENT, THIS IS THE STORY OF ABRAHAM, AND HE HAD HIS WIFE SARAH AND HE WAS PROMISED THAT HE WOULD HAVE A CHILD BY HER, AND THEY WENT DECADES, AND SHE WAS UNABLE TO HAVE CHILDREN. SHE WAS BARREN. AND SO FINALLY, SARAH THOUGHT SHE HAD HELPED THE LORD OUT. AND SO SHE TOLD ABRAHAM, HER HUSBAND, SHE SAD, HERE'S HAGAR, MY uh, HANDMAID, SLAVE, 
and you go in and have sex with her, and her child will be counted as my child. She tried to help out God. And I tell you, every time you try and help God out, you're going to have an Ishmael, and you're going to wind up having conflict, and you're going to have to feed it, and it's going to cause problems. So Ishmael is the father of all of the Arabs. Isaac, the son who is eventually born to Sarah, Abraham and Sarah is the father of all of the Jews. And the whole Arab-Israeli conflict that we have today dates all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. So this is what it's talking about. It says, Haven't you heard the law that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, that's Hagar, the other by a free woman, that's Sarah? But he who is of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. And then he says in the next verse that these two things are an allegory. That means that it's an illustration of a greater spiritual truth. It's not just the physical things that happen to them, but there is a spiritual lesson to learn here that applies to us today. So these things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The covenant with Abraham that eventually produced Isaac is the covenant of faith, and the covenant that was made when Ishmael was born, that was done through the flesh. And so it's like the Old Testament law was that covenant of flesh, the Old, covenant, uh, the Old Testament covenant of promise that was made with Abraham is that covenant of faith that was made by promise. And it says here in verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. Mount Sinai is where Moses got the law, these Ten Commandments, and gave all the laws. In verse 25, for this Agar, and that's the Old Testament, Hagar with an H, but in the, uh, when they wrote the Greek, it was a little bit spelled a little different, but that's still talking about Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which is now in bondage with her children. Man, there's so much here. Let me just say this real quickly. I'm not going to expound on it, but it says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Did you know that if you look on a map, Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Desert, that little peninsula with the Red Sea and uh, south of Israel. But this says Mount Sinai is in Arabia, which is over on the other side of the Red Sea. I believe that the whole thing about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea, it means exactly what it says, the Red Sea. It wasn't on the east side of the Sinai Peninsula. It was on the west side of the Sinai Peninsula. And Sinai, the real Mount Sinai, is in Arabia. And man, I wish I had time to go into this, but I've got a friend, Bob Cornuk, who used to be a real estate agent in, uh, in Woodland Park, Colorado, and he actually went on an expedition over there, and he found a place in Turkey that is guarded by the military, and he snuck in. And anyway, he found uh, things with Egyptian uh, hier hieroglyphics on it, an altar where they made sacrifice to this pagan god that is listed in Exodus chapter 32. And the mountain up there, you can look, and it's just like somebody drew a line. I've seen pictures of it. And from there up, the mountain has been charred. It was such an intense fire that the rocks have actually been crystallized, and they're black from just this line up, which goes along perfectly with the Lord descending on Mount Sinai in a fire, and the people saw it. So anyway, this is a reference to that, and I really believe that Mount Sinai is over in Arabia, not in what's called the Sinai Desert. So it says, This Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. This wasn't only talking about being in bondage to the Romans, but it was in bondage to the law. They were under the law. And of course, Jesus came, and the law was given until the seed should come. That's what it says in Galatians chapter 3. That seed was Christ. And now that Christ had come, and that faith was opened up to people, that they could have a relationship with God by faith, well, then they weren't supposed to be under the law. But as a whole, the Jews were still under the law, and that's what he's talking about. They're in bondage with her children. But in verse 26, it says, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. 
AND AGAIN, THIS ISN'T TALKING ABOUT THE PHYSICAL JERUSALEM. IT'S TALKING ABOUT THE SPIRITUAL JERUSALEM. IN THE BOOK OF REVELATION, IT SAYS THAT THE NEW JERUSALEM WILL DESCEND OUT OF HEAVEN AND COME AND BE PLACED HERE ON THIS EARTH. SO IT'S, AGAIN, TALKING ABOUT THE LAW. IT'S SYMBOLIZED. THE LAW IS SYMBOLIZED BY HAGAR'S SON, WHICH IS ISMAEL, AND THE COVENANT OF PROMISE, THE FREEDOM THAT WE NOW HAVE IN CHRIST IS SYMBOLIZED BY THE SON OF PROMISE, WHICH WAS ISAAC, AND THAT'S WHAT IT'S TALKING ABOUT. IN VERSE 27, IT SAYS, FOR IT IS WRITTEN, REJOICE THOU BARREN THAT BEAREST NOT, BREAK FORTH AND CRY THOU THAT TRAVAILEST NOT, FOR THE DESOLATE HATH MANY MORE CHILDREN THAN SHE WHICH HATH A HUSBAND. THIS IS A QUOTATION FROM ISAIAH CHAPTER 54, VERSE 1. OF COURSE, ISAIAH CHAPTER 53 is the, IS THE CHAPTER ABOUT JESUS BEING THE LAMB THAT TAKES AWAY THE SINS OF THE WORLD. BY HIS STRIPES WE WERE HEALED. HE'S BORE OUR INFIRMITIES, CARRIED OUR SICKNESSES, ETC. AND THEN CHAPTER 54 TALKS ABOUT THE BENEFITS THAT JESUS WOULD BRING THROUGH THIS NEW COVENANT. AND IT SAYS THOSE WHO ARE BARREN SHOULD NOW REJOICE BECAUSE YOU HAVE MANY MORE CHILDREN THAN THE MARRIED WIFE. WHAT DOES THAT MEAN? THAT'S JUST SAYING THAT INSTEAD OF YOU PRODUCING THROUGH THE FLESH BY YOUR OWN POWER, THOSE WHO WILL RECOGNIZE THEIR COMPLETE INABILITY TO EVER PRODUCE RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD BASED ON YOUR OWN GOODNESS, YOU'RE THE ONES WHO RECEIVE THIS SALVATION THAT COMES THROUGH JESUS. AND BECAUSE OF THAT, THERE HAVE BEEN MANY MORE CHILDREN BORN TO GOD WHO'VE COME TO GOD THROUGH GRACE THAN COULD EVER COME TO HIM THROUGH THE LAW. THAT'S WHAT THAT OLD TESTAMENT PROPHECY IS TALKING ABOUT, AND THAT'S WHAT PAUL IS QUOTING HERE. SO IN VERSE 28, IT SAYS, NOW WE, BRETHREN, AS ISAAC WAS, ARE THE CHILDREN OF PROMISE. BUT AS THEN, HE THAT WAS BORN AFTER THE FLESH PERSECUTED HIM THAT WAS BORN AFTER THE SPIRIT, EVEN SO IT IS NOW. AGAIN, FOR THOSE OF YOU THAT DON'T KNOW OLD TESTAMENT SCRIPTURE, ISHMAEL WAS THE SON THAT WAS BORN THROUGH HAGAR, SARAH'S HANDMAID, AND HE WAS ABOUT 17 YEARS OLD WHEN THE SON OF PROMISE, ISAAC, WAS BORN TO ABRAHAM AND SARAH. AND ISHMAEL MADE FUN AND PERSECUTED ISAAC. AND IT BECAME SO INTENSE, THE CONFLICT BETWEEN THEM, THAT FINALLY SARAH CAME TO ABRAHAM AND SAID, YOU NEED TO CAST OUT THIS this BOND SLAVE AND HER SON BECAUSE HE IS NOT GOING TO INHERIT WITH MY SON. AND THE SPLIT WAS SO BAD, ABRAHAM HATED IT. IT SAID THAT IT GRIEVED HIM, BUT WHEN HE PRAYED ABOUT IT, THE LORD SAID, DO WHAT SARAH SAID, BECAUSE THE, the SON OF THE BONDWOMAN WILL NOT INHERIT WITH YOUR SON OF PROMISE. IN OTHER WORDS, THAT WAS TOTALLY A WORK OF THE FLESH. I NEVER TOLD YOU TO DO IT, AND YOU ARE NOT GOING TO MAKE HIM, EVEN THOUGH HE WAS THE FIRSTBORN, THE PROMISE SEED. NO, ISAAC IS THE PROMISE SEED. SO THAT'S THE BACKGROUND THAT THEY'RE REFERRING TO. SO AGAIN, HERE IN VERSE 29, BUT AS THEN HE THAT WAS BORN AFTER THE FLESH PERSECUTED HIM THAT WAS BORN AFTER THE SPIRIT, EVEN SO IT IS NOW. AND THIS IS TALKING ABOUT THOSE WHO ARE LEGALISTIC AND PREACHING THAT YOU HAVE TO EARN RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD THROUGH YOUR PERFORMANCE. THEY'RE ALWAYS GOING TO HATE THE PEOPLE WHO PREACH THAT KNOW IT'S JUST BY GRACE THROUGH FAITH. AND SO THERE'S THIS CONFLICT, AND THAT'S WHAT IT'S REFERRING TO. IN VERSE 30, IT SAYS, NEVERTHELESS, WHAT SAITH THE SCRIPTURE? CAST OUT THE BONDWOMAN AND HER SON, FOR THE SON OF THE BONDWOMAN SHALL NOT BE HEIR WITH THE SON OF THE FREE WOMAN. SO THEN, BRETHREN, WE ARE NOT CHILDREN OF THE BONDWOMAN, BUT OF THE FREE. SO THIS WHOLE THING ABOUT ABRAHAM AND SARAH AND ISAAC AND VERSUS ISHMAEL, THE SON THAT WAS BORN OF HAGAR, THE SLAVE, THIS, ALL OF THESE THINGS THAT HAPPENED, THAT'S AN ALLEGORY OF HOW THE NEW COVENANT IS ESTABLISHED WITH ISAAC, THE CHILD THAT CAME BY PROMISE, NOT BY THEIR OWN EFFORT, NOT BY THEIR OWN GOODNESS, AND THAT IS ALWAYS GOING TO BE IN CONFLICT WITH THOSE WHO TRY AND HAVE a RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD BASED ON THEIR OWN GOODNESS. IT'S JUST CONFLICT, AND YOU STILL SEE THE SAME THING HAPPENING TODAY. YOU KNOW, WHEN I FIRST STARTED PREACHING GRACE 40, 50 YEARS AGO, MAN, I WAS OSTRACIZED. I WAS TOLD THAT I WAS OF THE DEVIL, AND THERE WAS A TREMENDOUS AMOUNT OF OPPOSITION. RIGHT NOW, IN THE UNITED STATES, IN THE BODY OF CHRIST, PREACHING ON GRACE HAS BECOME SOMEWHAT POPULAR. NOW, THERE'S STILL PEOPLE THAT JUST TOTALLY REJECT IT, BUT I MEAN, AS A WHOLE, THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE PREACHING GRACE, AND THEY'VE EVEN GONE BEYOND GRACE INTO LASCIVIOUSNESS TO WHERE THEY JUST TAKE GRACE AS AN EXCUSE TO GO LIVE IN SIN. 
It's like, you know, there's a book that was written by Bob Boose. It was entitled As the Pendulum Swings. And he made this point on the front of that book. He had like a clock pendulum and he had it pulled way over here and saying that this is an extreme. This is legalism. People thought that you were wrong. And so you start preaching grace. And instead of just coming back to where they should be, no, they go way past that over to this other thing. And this is the way that it seems to go in the body of Christ. People don't just take the truth and operate in it. They go from one extreme to another. And when people who've been under extreme legalism hear about the grace of God, well, then they not only come back to where it's grace, they go way past grace, where it just justifies that there is now no hell, there's no punishment, you can do anything you want to. And that's wrong, too. You need to be in the center. You need to rightly divide the Word of God. So these are the things he's already said. Now in chapter 5, boy, he gets brutal right here. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage he's talking about is the Old Testament law. Don't be entangled with a performance-based Christianity where you've got to earn God's favor by your goodness. And then look at this in verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Man, that is one radical statement right there. And you've got to understand that Paul himself was circumcised. He said this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was circumcised on the eighth day. So it's not that circumcision was wrong. It was that trusting in circumcision, saying that that's what makes you a child of God because you had performed some ritual, some physical acts. That's what he was talking about. And he even says this in the next couple of verses right here. He says, those of you who are trusting in law are the ones who are fallen from grace. So this is a radical statement. And man, this offended the Jews because the act of circumcision was the number one action that had to be performed in the Jewish uh, religion. I think it's Genesis chapter 17 where God commanded Abraham to uh, circumcise himself and to circumcise Ishmael, his firstborn son. And uh, it was in Genesis 17, if I'm not mistaken on that. And it said that if they weren't circumcised, they had to be put to death. Romans chapter 4 makes a big issue out of this. This is the same author, Paul, writing in Romans chapter 4, and he points out that Abraham was justified by the sight of God, Genesis 15, 6, uh, 17 years at least before he received the rite of circumcision. So it was his faith that made him in right standing with God, and circumcision was just an act of obedience. You know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it... It would really benefit if you'd think about this, if you'd use your head for something besides a hat rack. <laughs> Amen. Why did God make circumcision the sign of the covenant for the Jews? Well, there's probably multiple reasons, but I think one of them is because is it was private. You don't go around saying, look at my circumcision. It was private. It was meant to be a sign of the covenant between them and God. And likewise, we are supposed to live a holy life, but that's really between us and God. When somebody comes, comes in and starts preaching and saying, you have to do this and this and this, it just violates the entire purpose of this whole sign of circumcision that God gave people. He says, if you are trusting in that circumcision, Christ shall profit you nothing. Again, today, circumcision isn't the real issue. Paul made these points so strong right here in Romans and in Galatians right here that really circumcision isn't something that religious people argue over much today. But I tell you what, the same principle is uh, well established in religious Christianity today. There are people saying that if you don't pay your tithes, if you don't live holy, if you do this, if you dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do, God's not going to answer your prayers. God won't bless you. That's the exact same principle. It's just using different things that you have to conform to. And it says that if that's the way you are living, Christ shall profit you nothing. Let me just say this to some of you right now. You are born again. 
YOU KNOW THAT YOU HAVE CALLED OUT TO JESUS. YOU HAVE THE WITNESS IN YOURSELF. YOUR HEART'S BEEN CHANGED. YOU KNOW THAT YOU'RE DIFFERENT. BUT AS FAR AS YOUR EXPERIENCE GOES, YOU CAN'T SEE THE PHYSICAL CHANGE. YOU'RE AS SICK AS THE PEOPLE WHO DON'T BELIEVE IN JESUS. YOU'RE AS POOR AS THE PEOPLE THAT DON'T BELIEVE IN JESUS. YOU ARE AS DISTRESSED AND WROUGHT, uh, YOU KNOW, HAVE FEAR IN YOU AS PEOPLE THAT DON'T BELIEVE IN JESUS. THERE'S SOME OF YOU THAT CAVED AND ju WERE JUST AS AFRAID OF COVID AND ALL THESE OTHER THINGS AS PEOPLE THAT DIDN'T KNOW JESUS. AS FAR AS YOUR PHYSICAL EXPERIENCE GOES, THERE'S NO DIFFERENCE BETWEEN YOU AND PEOPLE THAT DON'T KNOW JESUS. THERE'S SOME OF YOU, IF YOU WERE ARRESTED FOR BEING A CHRISTIAN, THERE WOULDN'T BE ENOUGH EVIDENCE TO CONVICT YOU. YOU CAN'T PROVE IT IN YOUR LIFE. AND YOU KNOW WHAT THAT IS? CHRIST HAS PROFITED YOU NOTHING, AND PROBABLY THE REASON THAT THAT'S SO IS BECAUSE YOU ARE STILL TRUSTING IN THE LAW. YOU ARE STILL UNDER THIS THING. YOU BELIEVE GOD HAS POWER. YOU JUST DON'T BELIEVE HE WILL USE HIS POWER ON YOUR BEHALF BECAUSE YOUR OWN HEART CONVICTS YOU AND YOU KNOW THAT YOU AREN'T LIVING THE LIFE THAT YOU SHOULD. YOU'VE GOT SOME PROBLEM IN YOUR LIFE, SOME SIN IN YOUR LIFE, AND YOU ARE DISQUALIFYING YOURSELF. YOU ARE THE ONE THAT'S MAKING CHRIST OF NO EFFECT IN YOUR LIFE BY YOUR LEGALISM. WHEN YOU START UNDERSTANDING GRACE AND YOU UNDERSTAND THAT GOD LOVES YOU BECAUSE HE IS LOVE, NOT BECAUSE YOU'RE LOVELY, I TELL YOU, THAT JUST MAKES FAITH COME ALIVE. I MAY NOT GET TO THIS VERSE, SO I'LL JUST REFER TO IT QUICKLY, BUT IN THE SIXTH VERSE, RIGHT DOWN HERE, JUST A FEW VERSES LATER, IT SAYS THAT CIRCUMCISION DOESN'T AVAIL ANYTHING NOR UNCIRCUMCISION, BUT FAITH WHICH WORKS BY LOVE. FAITH IS THE VICTORY THAT OVERCOMES THE WORLD, 1 JOHN 5, 4, AND FAITH WORKS BY LOVE. IF YOU GET OUT FROM UNDER LEGALISM AND LAW AND QUIT THINKING THAT YOU'VE GOT TO EARN GOD'S FAVOR BY YOU DOING ALL OF THESE THINGS, AND YOU START RECEIVING ANSWERS TO PRAYER BECAUSE OF GRACE, BECAUSE YOU PUT FAITH IN WHAT JESUS DID, IT'LL MAKE THE LOVE OF GOD ABOUND IN YOUR LIFE, AND FAITH WILL WORK BY LOVE. MAN, THAT'S POWERFUL. THESE VERSES RIGHT HERE, I'M OUT OF TIME ON TODAY'S BROADCAST. I JUST GOT A SHORT PERIOD OF TIME, BUT I ENCOURAGE YOU TO BE TUNING IN TOMORROW BECAUSE THE THINGS THAT I'M SAYING AT THE END OF THIS PROGRAM AND THE FIRST PART OF TOMORROW, THESE THINGS ARE THE ANSWER TO MANY PEOPLE WHO ARE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM RIGHT NOW. AND YOU KNOW THAT YOU'RE BORN AGAIN, BUT YOU CAN'T GET HEALED, YOU CAN'T GET PROSPERED, YOU STILL ARE DISCOURAGED, YOU'RE DEPRESSED, YOU'RE HAVING ALL KINDS OF PROBLEMS, AND YOU'RE SAYING, WHAT'S WRONG? WHY ISN'T MY SALVATION AFFECTING MY LIFE RIGHT NOW? I'M TELLING YOU, THIS IS YOUR ANSWER RIGHT HERE. AS MANY AS OF YOU uh, AS ARE JUSTIFIED BY THE LAW, YOU HAVE MADE CHRIST OF NO EFFECT IN YOUR LIFE. THAT DOESN'T MEAN YOU'VE LOST YOUR SALVATION. DOESN'T MEAN THAT IF YOU WERE TO DIE RIGHT NOW, YOU WOULDN'T GO TO HEAVEN BECAUSE YOU'VE GOT THAT SALVATION. BUT AS FAR AS YOUR EXPERIENCE GOES RIGHT HERE IN THIS LIFE, YOU AREN'T SEEING THE BENEFIT BECAUSE YOU'RE TRYING TO BE JUSTIFIED BY YOUR OWN WORKS INSTEAD OF PUTTING FAITH IN WHAT JESUS DID FOR YOU. YOU SAY IN THE NAME OF JESUS, I'M NOT GOING BY WHAT I SEE. I GO BY WHAT THE WORD OF GOD SAYS. THERE'S MORE THAN JUST THIS PHYSICAL REALM. THERE'S ALSO A SPIRITUAL REALM. I DON'T CARE WHAT THIS LOOKS LIKE. I KNOW WHAT GOD'S WORD SAYS. I WAS TOLD THAT MY LIFE WOULD BE ONE OF PAIN AND ISOLATION AND THAT FREEDOM WASN'T EVEN TO BE HOPED FOR. I WAS TOLD I WAS ALWAYS GOING TO BE IN A WHEELCHAIR. I WAS GIVEN THREE MONTHS TO LIVE BEFORE TOTAL HEART FAILURE. HI, I'M JULIANNE HARTMAN FROM LOS ANGELES, CALIFORNIA, AND I WAS TOLD THAT I WOULD NEVER RECOVER FROM FIBROMYALGIA. I WAS IN AND OUT OF EMERGENCY ROOMS AND SPENT OVER $300,000 SEARCHING FOR A CURE TO NO AVAIL. I WAS JUST ABOUT TO GIVE UP WHEN I DISCOVERED ANDREW WOMACK ON TELEVISION. AND ANDREW SHOWED ME FOR THE FIRST TIME THAT BY THE STRIPES OF JESUS, I WAS ALREADY HEALED. IN A MATTER OF WEEKS, I RECEIVED MY HEALING AFTER LISTENING TO ALL OF THE TEACHINGS MADE AVAILABLE ONLINE. AND TODAY, 10 YEARS LATER, I'M STILL WALKING IN MY HEALING, AND I'M NOT ALONE. I WAS HEALED OF FIBROMYALGIA AND ENVIRONMENTAL ILLNESS. I WAS HEALED OF LYME DISEASE. I WAS HEALED OF LUPUS AND HEART FAILURE. Because people like you partnered with Andrew Womack Ministries, we've all been given our lives back. We cannot thank you enough for your generosity, but there are still millions more out there seeking the truth that set us free. Will you help us bring this message to them? You can reach people like me who are trapped in their home 
and not aware of the fullness of what the gospel says that we can be free from everything the enemy tried to put on us. I would not be here if it wasn't for this ministry and I just really encourage you to become a partner today. Why wouldn't you want to partner with Andrew Womack Ministries? Become a partner today. To help us set more people free, become a partner by visiting awmi.net slash give or call our helpline at 719-635-1111. We'd love to have you join us today. Today, Andrew is offering his Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. This extraordinary resource contains his footnotes and commentary on over 26,000 Bible verses. Andrew has priced this valuable study tool at only $120, but you can get it today for $80. This is a limited time offer. Go to awmi.net to download yours today. Once again, I'd like to encourage you to please get this teaching verse by verse through Galatians. We have it in DVD and also in CD. And then we're offering my living commentary, which I've mentioned this often, but this is, in my opinion, the best thing I have to offer people. It's a digital commentary on 26,000 verses out of the 31,000 verses in the Bible. It would be a real blessing to you. Listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Andrew's new series, Galatians, is available as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I want to invite you to come and sit under the Word of God four hours a day, five days a week for two or three years. I promise you, it would transform your life. You know, God has put it on my heart to make disciples, and the best way I have of doing that is through our Karis Bible College. We not only have our main campus in Woodland Park, Colorado, but we have campuses scattered all over the world. You can go to our website to get information on it, but I promise you, this is a deal changer. Many of you know there's more and you just don't know how to get there. Come and let us help you discover who you are in Christ and who He is in you. It'll change your life. I tell you, I'm excited. God is going to do something special during these meetings. We love it because we're here and we're enjoying it. We're seeing it and it's making a difference. I'm telling you, in the spirit, you've got more power than the devil, more power than cancer, more power than poverty, more power than depression. You've got whatever it is that you need. Andrew's teaching and the love that he has for God's word and truth, it is the gospel truth. I'm pleased to announce that we now have my television program translated into Spanish. We have a lot of my materials available in Spanish, but let your friends know that we're now broadcasting our daily program in Spanish.